OK, now let's talk about quantum gravity. So my talk title has changed somewhat in reaction to you know, people being mystified about this incompatibility between quantum theory and gravity. So from the point of view that of a practitioner, that's not a super helpful way of thinking about the problem. So let me explain what my view is. So uh, I, I should start by saying what my perspective is on the quantum plus uh, gravity issue. So I'm aiming, so I'm a theoretician, I'm aiming to construct a fundamental theory of quantum gravity as a non-perturbative diffeomorphism invariant quantum field theory of dynamical geometry and study its properties in a Planckian regime. So many words in this first sentence are important. The fundamental is important, the non-perturbative is important, the diffio invariant is important, of course QFT, and the dynamical character of the geometry is also important. Now, as many of you are aware, this presents major technical, physical, and conceptual problems, uh, challenges. So dealing with quantum field theoretic infinities, the absence of an a priori fixed background space-time, one has to devise appropriate numerical and renormalization group uh, tools. And you know, as a sanity check, whatever quantum gravity theory you have, you should check that it has that, that the right classical limit comes out. And of course, we want to relate it eventually to some kind of phenomenology. The faster, the better. Now, uh, the main message is that, well, we are on our way, and this is actually possible. And I want to explain this by a prototype, we could say, of, of quantum gravity theory that achieves this. And that's the approach I've been involved in, and of course, with, have developed with, with colleagues of mine. Uh, that's this research program of, of causal dynamical triangulations. So that's a complicated word. I'll explain what this is about for those of you who, who haven't come across it. So uh, the virtue, if nothing else, is it sets a frame, a concrete frame. So beyond going beyond taste and style, namely a concrete also computational framework, and which tells us for what we may reasonably expect to be able to achieve in quantum gravity. OK, so why should you care, the audience? So various perspectives are, of course, represented uh, at this meeting. So for the quantum gravity aficionados in particular, uh, so uh, the interesting thing is I'm not using any exotic ingredients here, but nevertheless, non-trivial and very unexpected results come out of this approach. So we have a functional computational network, which I call our lab. And of course, we have few experiments, but our lab, to some extent, is a computational lab that takes that role. And what we do is uh, define and evaluate certain quantum observables beyond perturbation theory. So to summarize the story, to, to, well, to whom this is a meaningful comparison is to say, well, CDT, this approach, is to quantum gravity, what led to QCD very powerfully, is to non-abelian gauge theory, namely a tool, a non-perturbative tool, to learn quantitatively what the theory is about. If, so good, more about this later. To the people who are working on cosmology here, uh, the most likely phenomenological predictions to come out of that will be in early universe quantum physics. We are not there yet, in part because what I'm doing is not quantum cosmology, so reducing degrees of freedom and then quantizing, but I'm trying to derive kind of true cosmological results from the full uh, quantum theory. So uh, for those of you doing quantum you know, gravity experiments in the lab involving the quantum plus gravity, uh, I'm afraid I don't have very much uh, to say about the weak uh, gravity regime, uh, other than saying, uh, yeah, I'm watching many of these things with great interest. Uh, I'm sometimes concerned about you know, the, the, the subtleties that come in when one describes the situations that have to do basically often with distinguishing you know, gauge from physics. So, uh, but you know, 
most of you <laughs> practitioners may be well aware of those pitfalls, but it's an important, I think it's an important thing to, to pay attention to. So those of you who like fundamental principles and maybe derive quantum gravity even by just you know, postulating a bunch of principles uh, in the first place. So uh, I'm not using anything but quantum field theory uh, and general relativity, and they turn out to be perfectly compatible in my way of looking at it. And yeah, I'm giving you a, a blueprint, a prototype of a kind of bottom-up realization of how to do this. It turns out that uh, you know, talking about fundamental principles, causal structure seems to be essential in this game. And uh, the theory, if it can be shown to exist non-perturbatively, will be unitary. So that's important and interesting. So what the heck is the problem with quantum gravity? Why have we to been talking about this for decades? Well, my way of putting it is to say, well, the, the essential difficulty and challenges is, is that it's a theory of space-time and not on a fixed space-time. So, uh, and of course, as, as we well know, that's an, that's, that's an old result. Uh, the quantum theory based on this perturbative split that I'm mentioning here of the four-dimensional Lorentzian metric into a a, a, a fixed Minkowski piece, eta mu nu, plus a small perturbation uh, uh, is non-renormalizable. So it has non-curable divergences. So we have to do something to address uh, this situation. Um, standard relativistic quantum field theory, therefore, if you are after a fundamental theory of quantum gravity, is, is not applicable. And uh, the issue is that there is no blueprint to follow. You know, and that's why ideas have proliferated of how one might address this problem. Uh, so what is there? Well, if you look at the rest of quantum field theory, I think the closest uh, one can compare it to is uh, non-perturbative uh, QCD, which has been studied with lattice methods. You know, uh, but, of course, this is a theory that lives on a fixed background, uh, unlike gravity, and it also has very different symmetries. So if one wants to emulate any of these ideas one has to adapt them to here. And that's what, in part, we have been doing, and that has taken us quite a while. So there are no experiments with observations to guide theory building, which, of course, has been in the way of making progress and even of defining what you mean by progress. Um, uh, cutting a, a very long story, very short, so gra quantum gravity and non-perturbative quantum gravity, I'm characterizing here, here up to the year 2000, characterized by a large variety of approaches, and, okay, maybe some, yeah, but I, I could characterize it as, well, we didn't know what to compute, and we didn't know how to compute it, but everyone was very opinionated about what was the right way of doing it. Okay, now, maybe in the meantime, we've all become a little bit more humble, and so I would characterize the development of quantum gravity since 2000 as a, the post-extended objects era, which actually has seen a revival renaissance of good old quantum field theory and the path integral in particular. And we have been learning how and what to compute in quantum gravity. So let me take the opportunity here to uh, direct you to an article I've written uh, for conference proceedings, um, also for people who, who don't know too much about quantum gravity, I called it quantum gravity in 30 questions, which gives you kind of bite-sized, in bite-sized uh, bits, um, taking 30 questions as an excuse, uh, uh, a view of quantum gravity as I see it today. Okay, now let me talk about my own baby. So these are is this approach of causal dynamical triangulations, or CDT for short. So what is this in a nutshell? So it is a gravitational path integral. So we've, of course, seen path integrals in previous talks here over the metric degrees of freedom. So G mu nu, the, the Lorentzian form metric. So that's what, what this box here you know, tells you. So it's, it's very schematic. Uh, so we are integrating over geometries, right? So there's a... It's a, it's a of course, a, a gauge, uh, there is gauge freedom in, in, in the matrix G, and uh, you, you just integrate over equivalence classes of Lorentzian matrix modulo of these diffeomorphisms or coordinates uh, changes, and weigh each with some measure dg, may weigh each of these uh, with an amplitude e to the i gravitational action of G. Now, 
the approach is non-perturbative, which in the following I will often abbreviate as NP. That's, of course, a very important way to specify things. Uh, it's background independent, so no metric is distinguished a priori in this business. It starts out in Lorentzian signature, so it's not Euclidean quantum gravity. It's in 4D, and it's not grand unified. So uh, I'm happily starting with kind of pure gravity to, you know, initially and later on consider what happens when I couple matter. And I say something about this later. So uh, the origins go back to the distant days of the last century, 1998, where, uh, so this, this approach didn't come from nothing, but it came from actually, uh, if you like, uh, the, the, the wish to make string theory, to find a non-perturbative formulation of string theory. So then people uh, triangulated world sheets uh, and you know, were performing state sums over those. And what this ended up, you can look at this uh, if you don't couple matter to these world sheets as string theory in zero dimensions. And this is nothing but two-dimensional quantum gravity. And that's what also went by the name of dynamical triangulations. Um, so, you know, taking two-dimensional curved world sheets and approximating them by putting together flat, gluing together flat triangles and, you know, by considering all ways of doing this and taking a path sum, forming, hopefully, finding uh, a non-trivial, non-perturbative description of, of world sheets. That didn't quite work out, but uh, it was an interesting starting point for people to think about quantum gravity in exactly the same way but it was all happening in Euclidean. And people applied it to higher dimensions and there were, nothing interesting came out of it, uh, to cut a long story short. And one of the conjectures that, which formed the origin of this approach of CDT was to say, yeah, what is missing there? Maybe the causal structure of space-time. If you're doing Euclidean quantum gravity, there's no time. There are no light cones. There is no causal structure. Uh, maybe that's what we are missing, and maybe that's why these path integrals don't really find anything interesting. So that was a conjecture. We thought long and hard about how to bring causality or causal structure rather back into the path integral. We had a concrete proposal of how to do it. We ended up with an exactly soluble model. We solved it, and lo and behold, it turned out to be inequivalent in two dimensions. Unlike what everyone has told, had told us, it's either trivial, said my colleague at the Max Planck Institute, or we already know it, Renate. So it came out non-trivial. Oh, yeah, here, Hendrik <laughs> was, was around at, at the time. So there's always good to talk. You know, sometimes it's not very good to talk to your colleagues. But I wasn't, we weren't discouraged <laughs> at the time. So, uh, so this is the origins. So what is this? So it's a path integral that starts out in Lorentzian, actually has a wick rotation, so we can actually do computations in higher dimensions. So it it's emphasizes geometry, which is important. I, I love geometry, uh, with a path integral uh, covariance and the power that comes with being able actually to address these path integrals by, by certain computational tools, which will be Monte Carlo tools after one has applied the Wick rotation that exists in this framework. So what, what is the trick to make the path integral computable? One uses a, regula a regulator. So one doesn't, that already came from the string world sheet, one doesn't look at you know, some sum over smooth manifolds. These are very unwieldy things, and we don't know really how to describe the set of all of them but we discretize kind of space-time in, into making it piecewise flat. And in 2D, it's very easy you know, to, to imagine. I take flat triangles and glue them together, and I can make kind of curved surfaces. But the same principle uh, is, is applicable in higher dimensions, uh, in, in particular four dimensions. You take flat building blocks. They're called simplices. So here is the, the one that is there in, in four dimensions. That's a fundamental building block of, of, of four-dimensional CDT. And you glue them together, and you assemble curved spacetimes. They carry curvature because paths can pick up non-trivial uh, parallel transports in, in these things. So, uh, so one uses a regularized version of curved spaces but, but the beauty of the thing is that you don't need to use coordinates. So you, you actually, these piecewise flat simplicial manifolds T you get from building these things up, uh, they are already 
parameterizing the space of geometries rather than the space of metrics. So how could interesting things come out of such, you could say, trivial ingredients? Yeah, so GR, degrees of freedom, of course, regularized, you could say discrete us in a certain way, applying standard QFT methods, um, making uh, geometry dynamical by integrating over all possible curved objects of a certain time, um, and taking Monte Carlo methods, you know, basically brutally putting the thing on the lattice. Well, there you, you reach a region that no one has explored before. And very unexpected things happen in this non-perturbative region of geometry. And I also want to say, since then, uh, in the, the same thing, I mean, the old Euclidean ideas in mathematics, this has become a very, very big topic, that of random geometry, where people study at limits of ensembles of these two-dimensional geometries, and it drives you to a, a, a limit for a, what one would call a two-dimensional quantum geometry. It's called the Brownian sphere. So I, I put in here, for, for people who are interested, this is actually a mathematical reference who you know, describes everything from Liouville gravity, which is another name for this in two dimensions. So, but of course, this is physics, and you know, what the mathematicians do and can do is never quite what we need as physicists. So we need it not in 2D, we need it in 4D. And we really seem to need the Lorentzian signature rather than the Euclidean one. OK. So I think it came already up in, uh, uh, in, in Clifford's talk yesterday as some, in passing, you know, you said, oh, if I want to know what the theory is about, yeah, I just put it on the lattice, right? Then I, I can get a rough idea. But for gravity, actually, that turns out to be very hard. So, and that's also in part why it has taken us so long to, to do it correctly. So what's the general uh, underlying strategy? So the lattice, of course, like in statistical mechanics, right, acts as a regulator. So in our case, we have a UV, ultraviolet cutoff, which is basically the edge length of these little building blocks. So it's a UV cutoff, so that you can you choose it finite, but in the end, you want to shrink this A away to zero. So you want to think of a chunk of space-time, you triangulate it in some way, but then you're interested in the limit where you make the triangulation finer and finer and finer, and try to understand whether a meaningful continuum and scaling limit exists. So, and you're happy if you, the this, this, this statistical system, in this case of these geometric building blocks, uh, uh, has, uh, well, spans a phase space, so the phase space is spanned by the bare coupling constants you're putting in, that come from the discretized form of the Einstein action, if you see higher order phase transitions, so second or higher order, and then following the usual logic of critical systems, you are looking for interesting scaling limits by approaching one of these lines. And what we found is that in this framework of CDT, we do have, unlike any other approach to, to quantum gravity of this type, we do have actually second order uh, transitions that are candidates uh, for a continuum theories. Okay, so you take a limit A equal to zero, which I already said, you have to renormalize your bare couplings appropriately, and uh, the beauty is that by virtue of this critical behavior near such a phase transition, most of the regularization details in the final continuum theory turn out to be absolutely uh, unimportant. So if you're lucky and if this works, you are ending up with a theory that depends on maybe just a few parameters, you know, one, two that you have to fine tune. So that is a kind of what I call essential uniqueness. And of course, that such a mechanism is, uh, is not present necessarily in, in general approaches to quantum gravity. So computationally, there is the benefit that you, know, you have a lattice formulation, which kind of computationally reaches where other methods cannot yet say anything. So uh, of course, it's subject to numerical limitations. But that's always the case for lattice theory. So you have to live with error bars. Uh, and, but as I said, if a continuum theory exists, uh, it's essentially unique. Now, how do you go about putting gravity on the lattice? Well, the first attempts were in the 70s, where people were very much inspired by the successes of putting gauge field theories on the lattice. Yeah? And of course, I, in the last 40 years, they have immensely refined their method, and it's a, an enormously powerful tool to explore the non-perturbative region of QCD. 
Okay, so people were thinking, okay, gravity, how can we do something similar with gravity? Ah, the easiest thing to put it in a gauge theoretic formulation, so a first order formulation, where you work with tetrads and spin connections. So the important thing is you have a connection, you have a connection, you can form a holonomy, and you put that on a lattice, like gauge theoretic holonomies. Uh, the problem, so this was played, this game from, from the early 19, late 1970s onwards in various flavors, and uh, it was also simulated, but there was analytical work, but it never led to anything interesting. So we cannot be entirely sure of why this was, because many, many assumptions and shortcuts were taken in order to make the thing computable, but what uh, the strong suspicion is that uh, the reason why nothing interesting was ever seen, uh, seen was that the diffeomorphism invariance is very badly broken here. So, there is, so that I call naive lattice gravity. There is a not so naive lattice gravity, which does things much more geometrically and seems to get it right. So it's based on some old work of, 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 of Tullio Regis from the early 1960s, uh, which he called general relativity without coordinates, which uses the idea of triangulating spacetimes. And the aim was originally to solve Einstein's equation in an approximate way without introducing coordinates. And the way of doing this is exactly the same idea I have already presented to you. You have a smooth manifold M and some smooth metric G mu, and you approximate it by a triangulation T, which is built out of a building blocks uh, which are flat and they are characterized uniquely by giving all their edge lengths, which are called here L, the LIs. I, I'm using the LI squares, so I can also easily uh, adapt it to various signatures. So I can have time like links, light like links, space like links, if you like. So then you re express the, the Einstein action in terms of these variables, and Reggie told us how to do this. Um, and I would say, uh, Classically, nothing very interesting comes out of this. It doesn't have any immense you know, advantages uh, in solving the Einstein equations. But the full power of this idea really becomes apparent in non perturbative quantum gravity. And understanding that has been part of what we've been doing kind of the last 20 or so years. I have talked 22 minutes, Phil. OK, good. So, uh, so the beauty of it is that there is no gauge redundancy. If you parameterize your path integral in this way, as it's done by these you know, approximating sp curved spacetimes with these uh, parameters, then uh, you get rid of this enormously difficult and technical problem of having to fix the gauge, having to isolate the physical degrees of freedom. So in a nutshell, so the path integral according to uh, this approach is here the formal expression here on the left-hand side, and what it becomes is a well-defined, regularized expression in, you know, in a finite volume for a finite UV cut of A, which are sent to zero in the end, and here the integral over G becomes a sum over all equivalent uh, triangulations which carry a well-defined causal structure. So that's, that's how it goes. There is some measure factor, and there is an E to the I, uh, S, where S is the bare action. So that's not the final action that will still have to be renormalized. So usually, of course, there, there are many sicknesses associated with gravitational paths integrals. So I'm just giving a few here and just say, okay, CDT solves, addresses this issue and solves it. So uh, usually, of course, this is a complex thing. We are talking Lorentzian. Um, and what people do say, okay, so up the hand say we, we cannot really do these complex amplitudes. We don't really know how to sum them up. So let's do a potentially easier problem. Let's just start in Euclidean quantum gravity and let's just start with four dimensional Riemannian metrics. So that's not what we do, but we start with the Lorentzian, but we have a well defined analytic continuation that enables us to go to the Euclidean sector because there is where we can do our calculation. So it's also hard usually uh, to, to, to renormalize uh, in a way that's compatible with gauge fixing the diffeomorphism symmetry. And again, this problem we don't have because we are already working with the geometric uh, kind of reduced uh, physical degrees of freedom. Now, it was already mentioned, I think, by, 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 by Steve uh, yesterday, I mean, path integrals tend to be highly divergent. And uh, in such a way, of course, we expect them to be divergent, but they are so divergent in gravity uh, that there's no unique renormalization. So here, by contrast, 
we have at least numerical evidence that the number of configurations here are exponentially bounded. So standard renormalization techniques are seem to be uh, applicable and should uh, lead to a, a meaningful result, if you're lucky. So uh, this is, of course, not a Gaussian path integral. That's one other reason why one doesn't really know what to do with this in general. But here, we are then resorting to Monte Carlo methods. And for that, we need the big rotation to really get quantitative results. And you can say this is a brute force approach, but there were quite a number of non-trivial steps. And my last comment is here, well, uh, why should this be a unitary theory? Well, CDT turns out to be reflection positive, so as a lattice gauge theory. So, and since that holds for every, you know, discretized step, uh, it almost, if a continuum theory uh, exists, it ensures that it is uh, indeed uh, unitary. So, uh, in my last few minutes, let me flash some results. So, we have a computational framework. What can we do with it? What can we get out? Well, we want to understand the physics of quantum space, and so roughly speaking, this is maybe, this is a ground state that comes out of this non-perturbative path integral, and uh, this is captured and measured by suitable quantum observables, which I call O-hat. Yeah, and you just, as usual, you stick them into your path integral over geometries. Here is some observable O, but the thing is, of course, in gravity, everything comes with a twist because of the euphemorphism symmetry. So an observable in pure young mill theory would be a local scalar, where you have just contracted all the indices, like f mu, f mu. But that's not enough in gravity to be an observer in pure gravity. But because you know, the, the diffeomorphisms uh, you know, move the point x, so x is just the label. So uh, a scalar at a point x is, in, in that sense, for the purposes of this year, is not an observable because I cannot point to x if I have just pure gravity. So uh, typical observables are non-local integrals of scalars. So here's an example. Yeah, it's just uh, uh, the Ricci scalar uh, integrated over all space-time. So uh, these are this gives a different flavor to these quantum observables. But some of them we have found and we have studied. And uh, however, they give you a, a window on this non-perturbative physics, that's unusual because it's formulated in terms of these global quantum observables. And therefore, it needs some expectation management to understand that the things we can relatively easily address in this framework are very far away from typically very local questions. One asks, you know, your favorite classical or semi-classical question that comes to mind that should be solved by quantum gravity. Uh, the problem being that there is typically not an easy implementation, I mean, operationally, uh, in this Planckian uh, setting, where all the observables have to be fully diffeomorphism invariant. Okay, one quantum gravity signature, you know, the only one, one could say, which is a genuine prediction so far of this approach is that when one studies a certain notion of dimensionality of these quantum space-times that come out of there, one finds that a dimension which one would classically expect to be four in the vicinity of the Planck scale turns out to be rather two. So that's a long, long story. Many people have looked at this in many approaches and found similar things to the extent that uh, Steve Carlip here has written a, a few papers on this, uh, conjecturing that might be a universal feature of quantum gravity. Another key result is the emergence of classical geometry from a purely non-perturbative quantum theory of which this is a prototype. So what do we do to, to say that? Why do we say that? We're looking at the shape of the quantum universe, the volume as a function of time. So we have a notion of proper time in this. And what we then see, if we look at the expectation value of this, this can be beautifully mapped onto that of a classical de Sitter space. It has fluctuations. These can be beautifully mapped on a semi-classical uh, set of uh, fluctuations of, of the volume. That's the old, old story. Uh, now, does that say we are talking, we have shown that a visitor space emerges? No, not at all, because we have just picked out a single variable to describe the geometry, its volume as a function of time. So we have nothing, said nothing about the local geometry of this. So, well, it's, it means there is a hint it might be the sitter, but we cannot say you know, it, it's described by the standard the sitter uh, line element. So until very recently, we couldn't say more than this. 
Uh, but now we have actually found a way to say something about curvature. So curvature is very tricky because you're sitting in a framework where your geometries look like this. So how can be a curvature tensor defined, you know, which is a, is a differential operator? How can it possibly make sense? It's a long story, which I have no time to tell you about here, but we found a notion of quantum Ritchie curvature that comes from discrete mathematics, beautiful idea uh, to implement a notion of curvature, which turns out to be a nice renormalized uh, way of talking about curvature in a Planckian regime. So this is just a slide to show you the type of stuff we do. You know, we do our measurements, so we have graphs, we have things with error bars, so no time to talk about this. So, relation to our actual universe. So what can we say? Number one, which I haven't yet mentioned, CDT predicts a universe with positive lambda, cosmological constant. So lambda has to be positive in order for this whole thing to work. So yeah, I call it a prediction. We couldn't say anything if lambda was negative, but fortunately it coincides with what we believe the, the sign of the cosmological constant is in the real world. So uh, as I have sketched, on large scales, well, we get a, four, a seemingly four-dimensional extended universe. Its shape and also its average curvature are compatible with those of a Zitter space. Again, this is very, very non true but it, it's still, you know, classicality is just confined to uh, the expectation value of these observables we have been able to identify and measure. So what's very remarkable is it's really from first principles, from the full quantum theory. Uh, okay, in, in principle, we have access to more complicated things, but this is future, you know, future, future work. So, interestingly, matter coupling. A matter coupling is easy. I add to the sum of all geometries, a sum of all matter field configurations. So, it's relatively straightforward to do in CDT. What we found, we haven't done a completely exhaustive study, that at the Planck scale, we find that the matter doesn't matter particularly. It doesn't have much influence, apparently, on the geometry. So whatever this might, uh, might tell us. So what are our current ambitions and prospects? So we have a computational framework. So it puts us in the position to really reap the benefits of this it, to produce numbers. So expectation values of suitable quantum observables, of which I've you know, thrown a few examples at you, without relying on additional ad hoc assumptions. So the art is to identify more observables, you know, as many as we can to give us even more information. So what is this quantum space-time about? But it's not trivial. Um, now, uh, the quantum Ritchie curvature, let me just give you an outlook of what I'm personally very excited about. It's a, it's a geometric, local, quasi-local quantity of a type which we haven't had. We had these dimensions, but the dimensions they don't tell you very much about, you know, G new like stuff. So here we have this quantum Ritchie curvature. What we can use it is, for instance, to look at a, at a particle by putting a world line in and trying to understand in a Planckian regime what kind of curvature, what happens there. We want to examine, we have a phase diagram in one region of the phase, and we, we have a de Sitter phase, in another we have a de Sitter phase with a singularity in them. Now, the, in the best of all worlds, this string-like singularity is something like a primordial black hole. But how can we tell? We could try and understand its curvature properties locally. So that's the program of my, my group at, at Rodbaud. To finish, um, so there's been genuine progress. So you are understanding the direction in which I, I, I'm saying things are going. So we are, instead of just comparing you know, approaches and arguing about, you know, what should be done if only we could do it. Uh, we have started comparing things, you know, how do you compute things, what do you get? And the most fruitful interaction of this type has been between CDT and the asymptotic safety people. And I would uh, mention Frank Sauer, as he was also working at Radboud, as one of the key people who've been pushing this. And f they can, we can, or they can, we can reproduce to some extent each other's results. So that's very encouraging. It's, it's, it's a new... It's a, you know, a new era for quantum gravity. Uh, CDT here, I've explained to you, is, is an example. Think of it as a tool, but space-time emergence can be shown. Work in progress, blah, 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 blah. You can ask me about these things. Um, a, a continuing challenge, which is not specific to this approach, is to relate you know, stuff we can measure, observables we can measure non-perturbatively, 
two things we, we want to know about, not just coming from phenomenology, but from, you know, QFT and curved space time from classical theory. So watch the space. Here are two CDT reviews, and I want in particular say the first of those has, uh, these are my dear co-authors, but in, in particular there is uh, Jerzy Jokiewicz, who uh, was a very close collaborator who unfortunately died a few months ago, very unexpectedly. So I'm dedicating this talk to him also, and uh, I hope you take something away from my talk today. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll just say that uh, we'll, we'll now go to questions for Renata, but also we might as well join it on to the general discussion session of this morning. Uh, Hi, Renat. Thanks for the really nice overview talk of this, actually. Um, I, it's, it's a bit of a technical question, but I want to make sure I understand the statement you made. Yes. So in this uh, limit procedure where you take the, the discretization length to zero, and then you said you're going to look for a second order phase transition yes. and renormalize everything. Yeah. I mean, that just naively sounds in direct conflict with how I think of perturbative calculations, where I find that the model's not renormalizable, which means you know, I, to renormalize the action, I have to add all the higher order curvature terms. Yes. So, so am I, I guess the question is, are you saying that there is an interacting fixed point that you get? Yeah, so this is actually the, the, the last, the point on my last slide. So uh, the, the, you know, the only kind of prototype way in which this could happen is actually that the, the asymptotic safety conjecture is realized. That means the theory is, perturbatively non-renormalizable, but non-perturbatively renormalizable. So that's the only type you know, of, of idea we have to, to solve this, as you're probably familiar with. So uh, in asymptotic safety, using partial renormalization group, so we have, of course, very good evidence that, uh, that this is the case. But unfortunately, of course, they have, for computational reasons, they have to work with truncated versions of the action, so there is some inherent difficulty of you know describing within that formalism uh, coming to a definite result. So we might be able to, with complementary methods here, to actually show that that this is the case. So we have been able to understand, to some extent, renormalization group flows in the vicinity of these transition lines. It's a longer story. It's very difficult to measure, and. Uh, we, we have a prototype first investigation of this, but then we understood that we are lacking observables because you need to define flow lines of constant physics. And we very quickly went out of observables, uh, which in part stimulated this looking for a curvature observable. So we are, we are planning to pick this up with the new observables at hand and you know, reload this study. But in principle, we could, in the best of all worlds, we will be able to verify or also falsify the existence of such a fixed point. Okay, cool. Yeah, good luck. I mean, just, just if I might, like, so the, in asymptotic safety, do people really think that the fixed point is just given by the, the Hilbert action plus matter, or are there no higher curvature terms? Because you use specifically the Regge action, right? Yeah, so, so one has to be careful not to, I mean, compare apples and pears. So here I, I emphasized in a, in, a, in a slide where I said, this is a bare action, what I'm putting in here. So of course, during renormalization of what I do, all these higher order terms are generated. Whereas in the FRG, it's really a truncation where you're looking at the flow in an a priori truncated set of monomials, you know. So it's, it's a slightly different story. Yeah. Um, other questions on uh, any of the talks this morning? Ah, so we've got two over here. So you have <clears throat> a De Sitter space-time, which has an effective cosmological constant, which I suppose is enormous. Yeah, it's a tiny space. Right. Well, I should, say, I should say, of course, one has to distinguish between what it, sorry, what it is in our simulations. Of course, our simulations will 
by virtue of the choices we made for these bare couplings, they, and the size of the simulation, they see a particular physical scale window. And indeed, uh, the universe is, my universe, my De Sitter universe is very small. It's like 20 Planck lengths across. And it is constant. It is constant. It doesn't decrease to allow us to approach in the cosmological constant we have now. Well, it will have an appropriate, I mean, the, the matching cosmological con uh, constant, right? I mean, the curvature radius will, of course, be very small. Yeah. Yeah. But this has to do, this is not a matter of principle. So in this framework, uh, lambda is not fixed a priori. So the renormalized cosmological constant will still be a free parameter of my renormalized quantum gravity theory. So it's, it, it's not fixed, but as I said, what I'm currently exploring is of course, to some extent dictated by what I can access numerically. So I'm, I'm investigating very small universes, but there is no, uh, this doesn't imply that larger ones don't exist if I could only, you know, I, I cannot currently reach them by in an obvious way, by changing my parameters. Thank you. I just want to make comment about uh, questions about my talk. So one of them was uh, Vyacheslav Smuhanov's question, how a boundary condition at the distant future can affect something which is happening in the present, as far as I understand correctly this comment, and similar comments from other participants. Uh, and a uh, brief answer is uh, black hole physics allows this. Let me explain why. So if you look uh, at the future singularity, so this future singularity, if you look at the trajectory, you mentioned space-like, it's exactly like a superluminal super trajectory. Now imagine that uh, instead of perfectly absorbing boundary condition, uh, you impose boundary condition which is perfectly reflecting. So what is happening then the following? This boundary in the future will act like superluminal mirror. So if you send pulse into the superluminal mirror, then it will be reflected back in time. When pulse is reflected back in, back, back in time, it will simply propagate back through the event horizon and come out of the black hole. So in this sense, if you allow this boundary condition, reflecting boundary condition, black hole is no longer black. Whatever you send in will be perfectly reflected back, and as soon as they come out from the event horizon, they will be propagating again forward in time. So this is a mechanism. Even though this boundary condition could be very, very far into plus infinity, still it will affect what happens in the present. And if you indeed impose this perfectly reflecting boundary condition, you're not going to have Hawking radiation. So that's my answer. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, Bill is next. Uh, and let me also remark that Michael Wright has managed to connect with us again and wants to ask him questions. Renata, um, you mentioned that the observables are these integrals over the four volume, which is sort of what you expect also in, in you know, the usual quantum gravity things. Uh, but those observables don't reflect what we're interested in in learning about the universe, which is how do things develop in time? How do things change and so forth? And this is related to another question in, in your definition of path integral. Path integrals usually are propagators between some initial condition and some final condition. But in your case, I don't know what, you know, are there, are there do you set up initial and final conditions on your integrals? Or, you know, that sort of ties into observables because if you had those, then one could sort of imagine that one is an earlier time and the other is a later time. Yes, so, yeah, to answer your uh, first question. So, yes, it's these, the, the simplest things are these integrals, but uh, also integrated quantities. So what one can actually find here are 
endpoint functions that are diffeomorphism invariant. So you might say, okay, what does that mean? Well, I, I tell you, a two-point function, right? Normally, you know, it's g of x comma y, <coughs> two points. Uh, generalizations are endpoint functions, and we know in standard quantum field theory, if we know all of those, we can just reconstruct the theory, if all goes well. Okay, so now there are diffeomorphism invariant versions of endpoint functions, and how does it go? I integrate over all locations x, I integrate over all locations y, subject to the condition that I have a certain geodesic distance between x and y. So these are objects that have been studied explicitly, say, in two-dimensional quantum gravity, just to show that these exist, and they have, you know, if one looks at gravity, matter-coupled system, they have standard, you know, fall of behavior as you would expect. But of course, in a theory that is pure gravity, right, we know, of course, it's diffeomorphism invariant, so, of course, the physical objects, I, I cannot pin things down, right, as I said, so uh, they have necessarily this somewhat awkward character. But in principle, all diffeomorphism, I would claim, or at least it's plausible, you know, that all diffeomorphism invariant information about the system could in principle be retrieved from such things. But it might, of course, be very awkward to do it in practice. So that maybe tells you that in the, this deep quantum realm, maybe there are more natural things to look at. You know, it, it gives you another view of what what are easy, relatively easy things to study. And of course, it has an implication for what you know, phenomenology I, I might be able to extract. So there is this bridge between you know, the non-perturbative language and construction and very classical thinking, which, you know, which is tied to the semi-classical you know, questions like, oh, what happens near the horizon? You know? It's very difficult to find non-perturbative operational ways of phrasing these questions. But that's, that's a feature, not a bug, I would say. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. It, it's, of course, nice to have explicit calculations in certain regimes. Uh, but on the question of unitarity, uh, if you don't look for a problem in the right place, you don't realize you have to solve it, uh, is sort of a comment. And I think one of the places where you most clearly see the problem of unitarity is in uh, the context of an asymptotic a state that corresponds to an asymptotically flat geometry where you send in two very high energy particles, say with ultra Planckian energies, and you do something like form a quantum black hole, that's where we see the problem of unitarity uh, and uh, the apparent violation of it if you, you know, of course, calculate by traditional means and the apparent need for new physics. And so uh, I think, you know, it would be nice to see how to address that kind of thing, say, from the point of view of causal dynamical triangulations and so on, but, you know, it, I think you would probably agree we're pretty far from that at this point. Well, uh, I, well, I gave you the argument, this is to say, I have a lattice theory, which is, you know, reflection, a base reflection positivity, and well, yeah, that's sort of a formal argument, though, and there's the no, question of how, how you reconcile uh, unit, you know, that statement that formally it should be unitary with the, uh, the actual issues we see arise in an ultra-Planckian collision. No, I, I, wouldn't, I disagree that it's just formal. I mean, that, that is the, really the, the necessary, well, not strictly necessary, but in the, in the continuum limit, of course, it, it's a sufficient condition under normal circumstances also in well, quantum field theory to have a unitary field theory coming from a lattice formulation. And I should say, most quantum gravity models that are kind of discretized, they, they don't do that. On these old well, models I was talking about, that for the most of them, they are not reflection positivity, uh, positive. Well, uh, if this approach even gives a consistent description of that uh, process where you form a black hole in an ultra Planckian collision, a quantum black hole, and then it evaporates, it's not really clear that you even have a consistent description of that at this stage, I think. 
Uh, is is yeah. that inaccurate? Yes, but I would say, okay, you know, if that gives me, of course, I you know, put it in the box, you know, as we were discussing yesterday, of course, I, I'm, it's difficult for me to, to do anything with asymptotic regimes because I'm sitting in a box. Uh, but if that system has, you know, kind of an effective Hamiltonian, which is symmetric, self adjoint, then I would say that gives me already indication that in the bulk, you know, there is unitarity. Well, so, yeah, again, that's so a what formal if, so argument until you see you can really evolve through uh, and describe this kind of process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I would say that is already something. I mean, how it will play out. So, what that kind of to say, so what are then the implications for black hole evaporation? I would say, you know, if this is the right theory of quantum gravity, of course, there will be also black holes and quantum black holes in there, whether I'll be able to access them with the computation means I have, I don't know. Well, put so, differently, if you have an answer, then you should be able to describe it in the familiar terms, you know, where we ask the question and say, you know, what, what, is the, what answer is it giving for how black holes become well, unitary? Well, the, the answer it gives to you is that, that amplitude, so that was the second half also of, 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 of Bill's question, amplitudes, yeah, will obey unitarity. So if I put open boundaries and I, you know, put states, initial states and final states, uh, the evolution will be unitary. Okay, again, the question is how, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, I think you have... Oh. Sorry, I have a quick question about um, triangulation. So you, in using um, this triangulation to express a space-time manifold in terms of uh, simply says, can um, homology group uh, play any role in tr uh, for the evolution of uh, a space-time manifold? Okay, yeah, so let, let me rephrase the question. I mean, of course, it's a tool, these triangulations. They are, of course, used in, in, in mathematics exactly to also to study homology or in general topology, right? So obviously, if you have such building blocks, it, it, it enables you to also, you know, talk about, uh, construct geometries that have, you know, arbitrary topologies. So, and that, that is a, the long standing issue and controversial discussed issue of whether in a sum over geometries uh, you should not also add a sum over all topologies when you do a gravitational path integral. So it's perfectly possible in a technical sense because my building blocks would allow it, but as far as you understand, already in two dimensions, so actually what, I've done, what I do here is always it fixes the topology because if you do not fix the topology, you get super exponential growth of states, and we don't really know, even in two dimensions, we don't even know how to handle this divergence. So then you get non borel summable expressions, which of course you can regulate, but not uniquely. I mean, you can renormalize, but not uniquely, and it's even worse in high dimensions. So although one might think, I mean, people have this intuition where I don't know where it comes from, you know, that yeah, some of our topologies should be added. So that has been said since the 1970s, since you know, Cambridge advocated the Euclidean path integral very much, and it is being revived in recent times, but it's then very difficult to handle the, the configuration space. It just becomes much too big. 